Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Our speakers and I are excited to talk about our experiences on, Alca on Alcatraz Island. It's going to be my pleasure to introduce them today. First, we have Pete Kelsey. Pete is the owner of VCTO Labs. Pete reached out to us back in November and organized this project. Pete has more than 25 years of providing technical solutions to filmmakers and creative people all over the world. Our next speaker is Tan Nguyen. Tan is Regal USA TLS Division Manager. Tan has more than 15 years of experience at Regal, and Tan is an expert in Regal's entire lineup of terrestrial laser scanners. Lastly, myself, Ryan Menendez. I make sure our public safety and forensics clientele are trained and become stellar users of Regal technology. So, before we get started, I'm going to go ahead and talk about the overall sort of structure of this uh, webinar. So we're going to start off by talking about the project scope and the overall mission. Then we're going to transition into preservation goals and future tourism potentials to the island. Then we're going to talk about the three Regal scanners that made, made this project really possible for us. Then we're going to move into data processing and data fusion across those various LiDAR platforms. Uh, finally, we're going to move on to our own personal experiences on the island and talk about those, and then we'll wrap up with some Q&A. So I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic off to Pete, who's going to talk more about this incredibly ambitious project, which is digitizing Alcatraz Island. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, I thought I'd, um, I thought I'd start with just really quickly go through a couple of slides uh, regarding the history of the island. <clears throat> Most folks are familiar with Alcatraz um, because of the federal penitentiary and some of the infi infamous inmates who stayed there. <clears throat> Pardon me, but um, the history actually goes a lot farther back than that. Um, and because, well, as a result of the project, um, all of the data capture we did, um, you'll, you get to see a lot of these layers in the data. So um, originally, I mean, the history of the island goes way, way back to uh, the Native Americans who um, have occupied, been on the island for millennia. Um, but in terms of sort of modern archeology, span um, the first real, I guess, construction or uh, man-made earthworks, if you will, on the island were basically occur around the time of the Civil War. Um, and this is just a, a publicly available map that shows some of the, uh, um, all of the gun uh, placements more than anything else, because Alcatraz is located very strategically in the center of San Francisco Bay. So with the outset of the Civil War, um, being able to defend San Francisco Bay was of high interest <clears throat> uh, to the army. Uh, most notably, just there, there's a shape in the very center of this map, which is the original building. It's known as the Citadel. Um, and you'll see that um, in some of uh, Ryan and Tan's scan data, because that is the one really obvious portion of, the, of um, this era uh, that shows up really well in the scan data. Can you go to the next slide there for me? Thank you. Moving on, uh, this is 1910. This is the era, this is essentially the time when the uh, penitentiary, the prison was built. Um, so you see a lot of the gun emplacements are gone or have been repurposed um, for use in other capacities. Uh, the cell house is the main building at the top of the hill built, as I said a second ago, right on top of um, the old citadel from the Civil War. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and then up to 1977, uh, the prison actually closed in 63, about a year after um, the infamous escape attempt in 62. Um, and this is just uh, a map again um, from the Park Service. It's publicly available. It gives you a bit of a layout, but more than anything, I just wanted to um, 
uh, impress that there there are layers and layers of history out here on Alcatraz um, that you'll get to see here very shortly. Uh, so in terms of the genesis of the project, well, Alcatraz is pretty famous. I mean, I think that goes without saying. Um, it is operated and maintained by the National Park Service here in the United States. And over a million visitors come out to this, come out to the island on ferries um, every day of every year. Essentially, Alcatraz never closes. So it is historically significant. Um, it's important to a lot of people. And um, the Park Service's charter is to keep it <laughs> operating and maintained and safe for all of these vis visitors, not only today, but going forward uh, infinitely, actually. So the genesis of the project, I'd, I'd done a lot of work with the Park Service before in my career, and I was looking for another park or section of a park to do that was manageable in size. And when Alcatraz came to mind, it was perfect. Um, it's really well known. Um, it's a great component for all of the reality capture, digital twin type sensors, hardware and software we deployed. Um, and there was a need. And the need specifically came from the Park Service who said, look, we'd really like to try to understand how at risk Alcatraz is to sea level rise due to climate change. So as soon as I heard that, I'm like, tell me about your existing digital assets of the island. And they essentially didn't have any. And I, that's a perfect storm for folks like myself and Ryan and Tan. Uh, I leaned and said, well, let's start with capturing the entire island inside and out, every structure, um, every tunnel, everything we can safely access with the gear and the park service said, this is great. Um, and a rather long uh, permitting process began, um, one for the scientific permit, another permit to fly drones. And then we had to wait a couple of months for the birds to actually leave their nests because Alcatraz has always been and still is um, a, a serious, I mean, <laughs> bird colony um, where birds nest every year. So once the young birds had fledged and they were off the nest, uh, we were granted the permits to uh, start work on the island in December of last year. So this was just a few months ago. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I immediately, it was one of the, it was one of those instances where careful what you wish for, because you might just get it. So when the Park Service said yes, and we uh, began the permitting process, I started calling everybody I knew. I, I've been in reality capture space for about 20 years. Um, and um, there was a, a photogrammetry component from the air, drone-based photogrammetry I needed some help with drone-based LIDAR, I needed some help with that, um, and a the terrestrial component um, to do um, all the stuff on the ground. And this included, anyway, to cut to the chase, it, it was a very large team. I think in total it was over something like 30 people. And as I was going through this process, signing folks up to participate, uh, one of the partners, Phoenix LIDAR, who I, I, I had known for a while, um, said, hey, uh, you know, we've been doing business with Regal forever. You know, many of their uh, lasers are in our, our equipment, our drone-based scanners. Would it be okay if we reached out to them? Do you have a need? And I said, absolutely. Um, um, I had history with Regal. If you go to the next slide, I'll show you an image. Um, this is me a long, long time ago. This is 15 years ago in Alaska, but it was 
my first exposure to terrestrial laser scanning, we were working on a, a famous bridge on the Alaska Railroad between Anchorage and uh, Denali National Park. And so I, I knew about Regal 15 years ago, and I assumed that much had changed in that time. So uh, I, I was connected with uh, Brian and Tan, and we, much like the rest of the partners, they said, both of them leaned in and said, how can we help? When do you need us there? And that was one of the really amazing parts of this project that I have to give a shout out to everyone, including Regal, who may in their day-to-day -day doing business might have seen other folks who showed up as competitors or somehow, none of that mattered. Everybody said yes. Everybody leaned in, everybody joined this project and focused on the solution, which turned out better than I could have imagined. And uh, um, the guys here are gonna take you through that uh, now. So I'll turn it over and you can see some of the well, gear be, and some of the data. Before, uh, before we move on, um, we did wanna uh, present this in a way that we have an open discussion to um, mm -hmm and chime in whenever we can, right? So for the audience, um, that's a very interesting machine uh, right there. Um, I, I, I've seen that machine uh, when I first started at Regal. What model, what Z series is that uh, for the audience to know? I, I wish I could tell you, I don't know, but maybe the audience knows. <laughs> yeah, it's I, I, it could be a 390 or a 360. Uh, it, huh? it was in the earlier days, but I do remember that machine. It was quite, uh, uh, heavy, <laughs> at least to say. I remember that too. Yeah, and then seeing the, the the technology from when you used it 15 years ago to the machine that we use at uh, Alcatraz, it was a night and day change, right? I mean, you you've seen. Oh, uh, technology oh my gosh, you 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 guys blew my mind. The two scanners you brought out, which I won't steal your thunder. You can speak to them, but the, the two things that just literally left me speechless were the one scanner doing 25 second scans and the other scanner being able to reach out and get returns at over a mile i couldn't believe it so i know you guys are yeah. going to talk about that but yeah talk about a difference from 2005 to today it's pretty amazing awesome all right thanks Pete. so um, let's go ahead and jump into the 600i. It's Regal's newest terrestrial laser scanner. So, of course, we had to take it to Alcatraz. Um, 600i is really everything you could want in a terrestrial laser scanner. I mean, it, it's lightweight, it's ultra fast, it self registers, it's accurate, and it's even a mobile, a hybrid mobile scanner. The 600i was absolutely perfect for this project. It did a great job scanning everything we threw at it. Even more so, as I'm scanning, I'm also able to get live feedback from the sensor telling me that all of my subsequent scans are getting registered while I'm doing my project as well. I mean, with a project of this size, that saved me hours and hours and hours of processing time that I would have had to spend otherwise back at my desk. Uh, this is really the only scanner that I could count on for a project of this size in the amount of time that we had to scan it all. So let's talk about the project as a whole and some data about the project. Um, we did over 500 scan positions in just 16 work hours, about two days of total scanning. Uh, we got complete coverage of the main jailhouse that included the first three floors, the basement or the citadel. I know that uh, Pete talked about that uh, basement that you see there on the top right hand side of the screen. And that was a total of about 28,000 square feet that we were able to scan in just about those 16 hours. All of the scans were done in 25 seconds with images captured simultaneously. Each individual scan position contains about 35 million points. Um, combining that with all the data that we captured, the project ended up being huge just from the Regal side. Um, the final deliverable contains more than 18 billion points. More than 1,500 images were captured by the 600i alone, and the total project size about two terabytes of data. All the images shown here are processed in Regal's own TLS software, RiseScan Pro. 
the data is nailed down to control to millimeter accuracy, colorized, filtered, and then exported as E57s for PEAT to use. The best part about all of those tasks is that they're done through an automated step-by-step -step wizard in our own software that takes seconds to use as well. So, before we jump on to the, to the next slide, um, I just want to uh, make sure that the audience know that we worked on this completely remote, right? So we were able to have, we had to share the data too as well. Uh, and the message here is that although we are collecting such a large data set and huge numbers of points, uh, it's still very, very manageable um, point cloud and data set. And that's, that's, that's the, another benefit and uniqueness of, of the Regal um, systems, software, and uh, data. Yeah, and I'll, I'll throw it again. I mean, I, I couldn't believe how fast you were moving, Brian. It was like you'd scan, I'd hear the scanner go ding, you'd move, you'd scan again. And when you explained that it was doing uh, registering scans as you were going, that, wow. That, that was yeah. so impressive. And the 25 second scan, just uh, so you have a, a reference of resolution, uh, it's actually six millimeter resolution at 10 meter range. And very, uh, um, um, uh, more than needed uh, in a very uh, small area, well, tight area. No, correct. The resolution on the 600i being that high for how long it takes is, is a game changer. It really is. Thank you, guys. So, to me, maybe one of the reasons Alcatraz has never been digitized is because it presents such a complex and challenging environment for really any laser scanner. The prison has a combination of wide open courtyards, narrow aisles, stairs, and tiny jail cells. You, you really need a scanner that is capable of scanning in any environment effectively. Uh, I feel that the 600i more than stepped up to the challenge. The first thing I want to talk about is innate to its own design, which is the three-point stand. It doesn't necessarily have to be put on a tripod. You can put the scanner directly on really any flat surface, which lets you scan from some very unique spots you can see on the left and the right there you have a i had to put the scanner in a on a bucket in that instance just to get really a good position there and then on the on that narrow stair, spiral staircase going up it's also very useful to be able to put the scanner directly on one of the steps there um, the next thing is you're really not restricted by tight rooms or large spaces large spaces the 600i has a minimum range of one and a half feet and about a maximum range of 3300 feet so those small jail cells really didn't impact our ability to scan the prison uh, regal's been doing cloud to cloud onboard registration since about 2015 with the vz 400i um, after almost 10 years of continuous improvement and development for that tool the 600i's version of onboard registration is second to none the scanner is able to transition from room to room without any issues and registration is done by the time you finish your last scan position. There's no need to carry around an additional laptop or a tablet in order to get that feature to work. And then finally, the last thing I want to talk about on this slide is just how easy it is to use. I mean, the workflow, once you set up your project, is so simple. You literally just pick up the scanner, put it in a spot where you want to scan and hit start, and it does all the rest of the work for you. Um, so unless you guys have anything else you want to add. Yeah, um, so you've done a lot of the indoor work um, and, and I did the, most of the outdoor uh, scanning. Now, uh, historically, Rigo has, has, has have not had a, uh, a dome scanner, right? Uh, were there any challenges that you saw without that uh, additional vertical angle um, to be used? No, absolutely not. I mean, if you move the scan position over a couple of feet, you're going to cover all the data that you didn't get from the prior scan position. So it's not an issue in this project at all, especially with just how much data is captured. Absolutely nothing was missed. Absolutely. And nobody scans from one place, right? No, absolutely not. Brian, that is an RTK receiver on the top of the scanner, is it not? Yes, correct. The scanner, you, thanks for mentioning that. <laughs> the scanner will connect to really any RTK network that's 
transmitting coordinates. So you can, you know, you can, you can even get the scanner down to two centimeter accuracy as you're scanning, you know, which for a lot of, this, a lot of people that's. This is, and this, this touches on a big deal, a big part of the ultimate deliverable to the client. Everything had to be geo-referenced. Everything needed to be tied into our survey control network, which we established before any of us showed up. Um, so a scanner like this being able to transition from the outdoors to the indoor and still have the registration happen, what does that mean? That means the indoor stuff is geo-referenced along with the outdoor. No, you're not going to get RTK indoors, but that's that was the workaround that I thought was that's really clever. Yeah, correct. Oh, yeah. Especially if we're going to register all of those indoor scans, you know, and it's all self-contained within the main jailhouse. You know, as long as you get really good geo-referencing on the outside, the sort of inside starts to take care of itself. Which is yeah, when you're um, and it's and it's always best practice. Um, to start outside and then to go inside and then when you go inside when your gps denied areas uh we have other internal sensors that take over and will give you um positioning and heading um and trajectory from the last position to the next one and also i want to mention that we also uh the scanner for the first time has three internal cameras too as well uh, so not only we're offering a uh, ladder solution we're also offering photogrammetry solution all within one internal kit so and that's the first for where we go Okay. Yeah, so the last slide I'm going to cover is um, just show off some pictures of data from the 600i. So on the lower right hand corner, you can see there's a church setting, uh, it's like a classroom slash church setting that the prisoners would at the time probably get together to attend something. And then um, on the upper right corner, you've got a library that um, a prisoner would come in and, you know, wheel in a cart loaded up with books and then pass, pass some books around to the inmates at the time. Over in the middle is just a picture of the water tower that's on the tip of the island. On the upper left-hand corner is a picture of some writing that was done uh, by the Native Americans during the time in which they were occupying the prison. And the lower left-hand image is probably one of my favorites. It's of the basement underneath the prison, which was just an incredibly cool place to, to scan. It was a great opportunity to be able to scan there, but the real reason I like this photo so much is that writing that you see on the top of the of that room there was actually, at least to me, it wasn't visible when I was scanning it. It's actually something that I saw in the scan data after I processed it because the scanner was actually able to penetrate some of those layers of paint and reveal some stuff that maybe you wouldn't be able to see with just the naked eye, which is incredibly interesting to me. Oh, and to me and to the client and to the park service because right our lead contact our our main the project lead from the park service was the park archaeologist so yeah making the invisible visible like this you know what a you know what a surprise and what a welcome surprise that is um but yeah let me go ahead and jump into the next slide so i'm going to go ahead and pass the mouse and keyboard over to Tan, and you're all good. All right. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, so Brian discovered our uh, latest uh, terrestrial laser scanner. Uh, historically, we've always had uh, the I-Series, so we call the VZ I-Series, and we still maintain a couple of um, models that um, there's the predecessor of the VZ600i, and one of them is the VZ2000i. Uh, the VZ2000i has been our long-running, uh, long-range scanner for many years. Uh, has been proven to work in harsh condition and with superior uh, ranging capability up to 2,500 meters. Uh, while ranging at such uh, long range, we also maintain a high accuracy and precision too as well. Uh, with an IP64 class, uh, rope, uh, it's, it's really ready for any condition out there um, that's harsh, um, even the condition that we were at in um, during the project. The first day we were on there, we were on top of the roof. It was uh, it started raining on us, very overcast, uh, also fog too as well. Um, but the, the 600, uh, the, sorry, the 2000i was able to, to handle uh, those conditions. Uh, just like our 600i, it also has an RTK uh, GNSS receiver ready. Um, 
and it also has a hybrid mode too as well, which um, you know, we will talk about um, in these uh, presentation. Um, to make, a, sorry. Mm, okay, there we go. Um, so we know that scanning across the bay was a challenge, right? And um, this project, um, one scanner could not do all. Uh, Pete knew that. So he brought in the best of the best to make sure that uh, if we wanted to cover long range, we had a system that can cover the long range. And in 2000, I uh, was the system that I thought could have done the job, right? So of course we had to measure everything. We had to make sure that the shoreline or the uh, the, the San Francisco uh, uh, mainland uh, is within a line of sight. Uh, so we took some simple measurements with Google Earth. Um, and then once we knew that we did have that range, that the 2009 can cover, um, we went ahead and positioned ourselves strategically so that we were at certain positions to cover uh, the mainland. As you can see here, uh, on this picture right here where you see the uh, greater than 2,500 meters, keep your eye on that building area right there. I'm gonna show a little bit more about it. It's gonna be very cool uh, here shortly. Uh, but yeah, so we, 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 we did our homework. We made sure that uh, the area of interest is within our uh, ranging capability, and then we went on from there. Um, one special, uh, a couple of special thing about our system is that um, it has selectable uh, laser pulse rate uh, to increase or decrease ranging measurements, right? And what I mean by that is that since Regal is based on a time of flight technology, uh, we use that to um, our advantages by simply slowing down the pulse rate to increase our range. So if you look on this chart right here, all the way on the right hand side, right, the max pulse repetition rate is 1.2 megahertz. Well, at that rate, we're max firing out pulse, but we're also um, capped out to 600 meters. Yeah. But if you follow this chart, you can see it will slow down the pulse repetition rate to down to just 50 kilohertz. Therefore, we can then exchange or extend our range up to 2,500 meters and beyond, which you'll see that a little bit later. Yeah, so by using this chart and using it properly, um, I, I think our users and even ourselves uh, can really uh, capture objects at long range um, very accurately, and very precise. And on top of that, with the multiple returns too at the bottom as well, it also helped us uh, working under adverse conditions such as fog, right? Say with a pinch straight fog um, at certain visibility um, and still capture objects in the back. Um, so yeah, so all of our systems, all of our terrestrial laser uh, systems have this option to that you can select different pulse rate to achieve different ranging capability. Um, here you can see is a fine example of that. So I did my first scan and uh, just a regular scan at the max pulse rate, which is uh, 1.2 megahertz. Um, and you can see there it took what, 44 uh, seconds uh, to scan, right? Uh, and that's 600 meters. But then at the same spot, what I did was that after you take a scanner, a scanner allows uh, users to isolate an area of interest and then change and reduce the pulse repetition rate to extend that range. So it's a very user-friendly system and very diverse systems. And what I mean by that is that once you have a job set up, you're not just locked into that pulse rate, right? You can change it on the fly. You can say, hey, I wanna scan long range here. I wanna scan fast here. And so, right, so it's really a user-defined system. And then after this 360 scan, and this is to get the overview of the area, and we use that for registration. Well, you use that for data fusion too as well. So it's always advantage to scan 360 degrees at the highest rate. And then when you want to then extend your long range, just then simply um, select your area of interest, slow down the pulse rate. And then from that position, you can see we capture um, data from the mainland. And what you can experience with that is that uh, you can see here, the range here will ex exceed 2,500 meters. Mm. And you can see the quality, it's still well-defined of the data. I mean, the object is still well-defined in the data. Um, here's a, a, a great view that uh, I, I uh, kind of put together for you. Uh, here's from the lighthouse. So uh, fortunately, we had access to just everywhere, right? And 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 Pete did it right. Uh, if you really want to document this, you have to have access. 
uh, and, and, and Pete did an excellent job of granting us access to all these areas, and particularly the lighthouse. Uh, that was a rather challenge to climb, uh, especially with a scanner in your hand. Um, I wish I had a picture of that to show you, but uh, but I can show you this. So here, I can give you a perspective view of the lighthouse. So this is actually inside the lighthouse, and we um, uh, what I did was I took a regular scan, and you can see those are the long range scans that I did from different advantage points, right? And this lighthouse was one of them. So a very cool um, display, and this is uh, this is what you can expect to see inside the lighthouse. So. Okay. Can, um, so here, I can, a, sorry, Jen. I, I can remember. I can remember. I, I don't. I won't remember exactly. But our conversation. Went, oh yeah, I can get. I can get the skyline there across the bay. And I can remember thinking to myself, "Come on, really?" <laughs> <laughs> and when you showed me this, I near fell out of my chair. I, I was just talk about exceeding expectations. This was just amazing. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And um, and I'll, I'll tell you what, on the first day that I was there, um, I was a little skeptical because I because I knew uh, how the machine will perform in certain condition, right? And that day we went out, it was a, it was not an ideal. It was very, like I said, windy, huge overcast, um, and then also fog and rain too as well. So, uh, but luckily on the last day we were there, we had beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sky. So, fortunately where we're able to capture a lot of data uh, from the rock to the mainland. So, um, yeah, so here's just some more close up. So this is San Francisco captured from 2,500 meters away. Um, and uh, just to show you how detailed we can get, right? So zoom into that area, you can see uh, the chocolate factory uh, uh, yeah. wording right here, right? I mean, uh, and I just add this at the last minute because I was just playing around with the data. I was like, hold on now, I mean, uh, if you can see this, you, you can definitely uh, uh, validate the scanner, uh, scanning at two, over 2,500 meters, right? Gosh, amazing. Yeah. Um, okay. And here's just some, so not only the scanner does wonderful at long range, it does a, also does a fantastic job at close range too as well. Uh, I think this is the main interest of Alcatraz. Uh, you can see you can see the the reading uh, the wording on uh, right above the door. Um, of course, if I were to zoom in more closely, you can see the very fine detail uh, that the, from the scanner, the laser. Uh, here's an overview of Alcatraz, San Francisco, and also the Bay. Right, so you can see uh, Alcatraz is the nearest structure to us, and then where that little um, river boat or bay boat, um, party boat, is right in the middle, and then of course. The mainland of San Francisco is all the way in the background. So very dynamic ranging scanner. Yeah, so of course, there was not one system for all, right? So um, coming from the ground, we also have to, well, Pete had to bring in um, the air too as well. Um, as Pete mentioned earlier, uh, he reached out to Phoenix. Of course, Phoenix is one of our integration partners for many years. Um, and fortunately, they flew one of our sensors up there. Uh, which is the Regal 120, which is a very nice sensors with many capabilities and unique capabilities, uh, such as the uh, native forward and backward scanning pattern for a completeness of scan data, uh, multiple targets uh, we can capture and process uh, up to 32, uh, high uh, scan rate uh, up to 400 lines per second, and also high, very high uh, pulse rate too, up to 2.4 uh, megahertz, um, very lightweight for, um, uh, for unmanned uh, air aircrafts. It's a very nice system and great choice to uh, use as a, another complementary system to your wonderful project. Um, and here's just some data. Uh, Pete, maybe you can talk a little bit about this. Sure. Yeah, funny yeah. That I had to Go ahead, Brian. I just wanted to talk about the scan pattern of the 120. You actually get a nadir forward and backwards, which really helps uh, when you're trying to capture the sides of buildings, especially so you can come at an angle and still get a lot of data that you wouldn't get otherwise. Oh, yeah, good point. Yeah, we that's funny, Brian. We were having the same thought at the same time. I was going to say exactly that because we had to get we had to get those building facades and with it, if the laser was nadir only, 
without those obliques, uh, that wouldn't have been possible. So this, this was just another, I mean, key piece of gear to be able to tick that box. You know, did we get it all? Yes or no? Um, uh, what, should there be, if, if there are any spots we didn't get, it was more because of where we were flying versus the capability of the laser. Um, so, and what you're looking at here, uh, the, the greater image on the left, that's the point cloud wow. from this Ranger 120 that the guys from Phoenix and Inspired Flight, uh, the folks who made the drone flew, um, which exceeded expectations again. As you can see, it's colorized, it's geo-referenced, um, there's a really nice SLR camera lens on the 120 as well. So it also was capturing images to be added to the photogrammetric piece. Um, and of course, all of the terrestrial stuff that Brian and Tan did could be added to this with little to no drama because it's all tied to the ground via the survey control network that we used. So it was... For me, as the project manager, that that was that was my biggest fear was we're going to be collecting an extraordinary amount of data from half a dozen different sensors. It has to line up because the, the objective, a goal actually, is one cohesive data set of all of this data, and we pulled it off. It it's still, I mean, an absolute career highlight for me that. Um, you know, the right gear, you know, we all focused on the solution, which was, which was what you're looking at is integrating all this terrestrial and airborne data into a single data set. And, um, only, and only when you do this uh, properly and, and correctly, like as you did, um, that's when you really get a real comprehensive data set, right? And, and, yep. and yep. yeah, that's the only way to do it. Yeah. So, and and this isn't this isn't isolated by any means, right? You guys know this as a, a, a data capture service provider. I certainly do. You know, an, an interior and exterior component is is common. It's not unusual. And to be able to do, to do it at scale with this many buildings, um, you know, in the challenging environment, because it's. You're right. I mean, when people ask, so what, what were the challenges? Weather is number one <laughs> by far um, because the time we were there, right? We saw the weather change. Chan was talking about it. Um, uh, birds, you know, if you're flying a large drone like that, birds are a challenge. And by the way, this hasn't come up yet, but I'll mention it now. It's not like the Park Service closed Alcatraz and gave it to us to do all the work. We right. had to do we had to do all this while trying to minimize negatively impacting the visitor experience. So there were thousands of visitors on the island all day, every day. So we had to be very careful right. about drone operations. We had to be very careful about, you know, not inter you know screwing up anybody's selfie that they've waited months to get to Alcatraz to take. So. Um, Anyway, the, the challenges were many, but again, you try you choose the right gear, the right people, and have a good plan, and you can get results like this. No, that is a good point. We I, I don't think uh, we we handled it really um, nicely. We did not interrupt the daily operations that the park um, was doing. You know, their way of making revenue uh, as well. So no, it was a it was a good point to bring up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think uh, next one. Next slide, please. If I remember right. Yeah, so um, I guess, well, so what about next steps? So what also folks in this industry, like Brian and Tan and I know well, is that projects like this often start with, you know, an initial need. And in this case, you know, help the Park Service identify um, at risk portions of Alcatraz due to sea level rise, climate change, et cetera. The fun part for us is when the data is done and a client 
has that sort of moment where they understand what they have, then the ideas start coming in terms of how can this data be repurposed? And again, I think I can speak for the three of us. What's when the questions come up, well, could we use it for the answer is always yes, because it's just software, right? So could, could this data be used to, uh, could we throw a, an earthquake at it? Because this is San Francisco Bay and the San Andreas Fault, seismically active area. If you have, the answer is yes. If you have the physics of a 6.0 earthquake or whatever, could we throw it at a model generated from this data? Yes. Could we virtualize Alcatraz to make a virtual experience for visitors who can't physically come to San Francisco? Yes. It's, it's, it's one of the most rewarding parts of being in this part of the industry is that is just that, is that this kind of data can be repurposed for anything, operations and maintenance, safety and security, virtual tourism, I mean, you name it. And so in terms of next steps, those conversations have begun. Uh, I got a great post from our uh, Park Service counterpart just within the last week. And he had a historic photograph of a crack on a wall on the cell house next to an image of the scan data. And he was doing change detection right has that crack gotten bigger smaller and then the lights are going off in his head in real time about yeah we ticked the box for sea level rise we did that but now it's taking on a life to, of its own as projects like this often do so things to come you know I've, I've had this dream since the project started that maybe alcatraz will become one of the world's first virtual natural parks. Wouldn't that be amazing? Um, it would, absolutely it would. Yeah, and what to say, Pete, can I ask you, uh, if uh, there was an area that uh, collapsed or something, could we use this data to rebuild it to back to where it was? Yes, yes, oh my gosh. So yeah, I'm the elephant in the room. How about historic preservation? We mm -hmm. now have, millimeter accurate data of this entire island of every building of every facility that is now a baseline survey that all surveys going forward in the future can be measured against Absolutely. so you're you're right let's say something <laughs> does collapse or whatever needs repair it can be repaired to exactly the condition it was in and I think I can speak for the three of us. That feels pretty good to oh, be yeah. to leave our fingerprint on that kind of data that will last essentially forever. For years and many, many, many years come out slowly. So yeah. well, if we're gonna move on to the last slide, I think this is probably the most interesting slide, I think. Uh and and I think Brian and, and Pete experienced the most out of this project. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so uh, I'll I'll tee this up. So <laughs> it it when in the early phase before we started scanning, it became obvious that the only way we were going to pull this off in three weeks, because that was our timeline. We had three weeks to do it all, airborne, terrestrial, everything. I said to the parks, we need to sleep on the island. We need to stay there. And there were, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> so anyway, cut to the chase. We slept in cells on the island for the duration of the project. And Brian <laughs> was one of the lucky folks who got to do that. And you're seeing, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Brian talk to that. And then uh, I'll share some stories of wow what was that like uh, the only other thing i'll say is because i thought this was pretty cool is that the park service said after we were the project was underway for a couple of weeks they told us that you know you and your team no one has spent this much time on the island overnight since the native american occupation 60 years ago <laughs> it was a really unique 
experience, adventure, I mean, call it what you will. We had to bring all our own food. Um, Brian, over to you. I, I don't want to steal your thunder. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. Um, yeah, these, these are these two pictures on the right and the left are of my my little my little habitat uh, on the island in the jail cell. Um, I guess I should start with my experience, the boat ride heading into the heading into the island. I I was taking the ferry, the last ferry to the island right before, uh, with all my sleeping bags and the mosquito net and everything. And a, a National Park Service's employee starts a ranger. She starts talking to me about about sleeping on the island and stuff. And I tell her that I brought a mosquito net for the mosquitoes. And I thought she was going to, you know, agree with me or tell me, yeah, there's a lot of mosquitoes at night. But I, I thought it was weird that they had me do that or that the mosquito net was, was something to bring because, because of the weather. It was like, you know, probably in the forties or fifties on the, on the island. Uh, but she told me that, that she sleeps with a mosquito net because of the mice and the rats and I don't know if she was lying to me or she was just joking but you know we went to the store and tried to buy mosquitoes <laughs> yeah they, they 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 were not they were they even they were suspicious of the fact that we were getting one for mosquitoes because of how cold it was they were just like Dude, there's no way there's going to be mosquitoes on this island and yeah that this lady tells this uh, national park ranger National Park Service's ranger tells me that that she sleeps with a mosquito net because of the mice and the rats on the island, which, you know, I, that kind of deterred me a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it, if you had an encounter like that, Pete, but when she told me that, I was a little. Wow. Did I <laughs> did I leave the part out of it when I was when I was asking you guys to come? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm weird feeling too, right? Because. Brian, of course, is my colleague, and that was a great opportunity. And I was on the fence. Like, I was like, okay, can't come on, just do it. Just do it. And something grabbed me and didn't put me on that last ride out to Alcatraz. And something did. And I get a call from Brian later, an hour later, say, hey, um, the reason why we need a mosquito mats is because of the rats. And I was like, I knew it. Something fishy was, 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 was going on about the mosquito nets. Well, in, in all truth, because uh, I think you guys showed up a few days after we got started. The first night we were on the island, we got eaten alive by bugs. I mean, it, I, literally eaten alive. I went into San Francisco the next day and bought every mosquito net at REI in San Francisco. That's what uh, they said. They said somebody came. That's what they said. Yeah. <laughs> They said somebody came and sold them out. Nothing was you. It was so funny. <laughs> but now that that was uh, and then of course the the two photos in the middle. It's just uh, one's in the morning and then one was at night. Because uh, we had to go use the bathroom outside uh, at night. There wasn't anything in the prison. So yet. I had walked out through the jail cell and went to the bathroom out. And then I saw the I saw the skyline and I just had to get a couple of photos. It was beautiful. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think I think at most, you know, it was six or seven of us spending the night at a time. And when the last tourist boat, there was one security guard who's on the island overnight and us. And he or she was down on the dock and the six of us were in the cell house alone. And now I didn't know this. Maybe this means I'm the last to know on many things, but... After we got there, I started hearing the stories about how haunted Alcatraz is. I'm like, wow, okay, well, um, I, and the questions have come up often, did I have an experience of any kind, see anything, hear anything, feel anything? I didn't, but one of my team members did, and let me see if I can give you the short version of this. We had to, we had to move him from his cell to another space in the jailhouse because the sweetest guy in the world, but he snored terribly and none of us were getting any sleep. So we moved him and all his gear, he wanted to have all his drones and all his equipment with him. So we moved him into this, uh, it's actually the mugshot room where in processed inmates would come and have their picture taken, you know, with a measuring tape behind them. We put him to bed. 
I, we go to sleep. I wake up the next morning. I go to the office where we're working. And there's my guy sleeping on the floor surrounded with all his gear. So I'm like, wow, there's got to be a story here. So I wait for him to wake up. And he tells me, first thing he says, why died? He said, I am not sleeping in that room again. <laughs> So either I'm leaving or you got to let me sleep back in my cell up with the rest of you. And of course, I, I said, why? And he said, there were there was like a party going on up in the, on the floor above me, 50 to 100 people moving stuff around, talking. Wow. Somebody was playing the piano. And I, that's what I said. And I was just wow don't leave don't leave with that story if you want people to come back and and and, and stay the ninth there on the right. next expedition okay <laughs> right right um so you know what a what a unique experience from so many perspectives right we did we did the work we did the job the the cocktail of technology hardware and software in my opinion has never been done before. I mean, if you looked at the collective of all the gear that showed up, the generosity of, of Brian and Tan and all the folks at Regal who said, yes, we want to help. When do you need us? What should we bring? I mean, and then the stories we're just telling about, wow, we got to spend three weeks in cells on Alcatraz and have stories Looks like there may be some lag happening right now. Can you hear us, Pete? I think Pete might have froze. It's okay. Uh, if he did, um, yeah, so my experience was great too as well. Thank you, Pete. Um, um, thank you, audience, for listening. Uh, I had a great experience. Unfortunately, yeah, I did not uh, stay the night and enjoy the, and had the full effect uh, as everybody else did. Uh, but um, no, it was a wonderful experience as, as well for me. So we, we, we reached the end. I'm going to go ahead and take some time now to answer some questions. We already have one question waiting for us from Jeremy Penton, who asked a couple of slides ago if that was a picture of Tan in the jail cell. And it no, Lord. <laughs> is, a, is a picture of Tan in the jail cell. <laughs> that is 100% tan. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was a good place to to sit down and have, not have anybody bother you. So, <laughs> um, we, uh, I don't know, Pete I mentioned earlier, but um, you know, Rigo was not the only one that took part in this. Um, there was other. Um, devices too uh, that was used we only talked about Rigo because it's the regal um, presentation so but there was other um, sensors being used too as well um if we have another question from claudio who asked um if there's parts of the point cloud that we can share um at this time we can only share images and you know speak about it but we cannot share actual data until the National Park Service is done with their work on the island. And at that point, the data will uh, become public information through the Freedom of Information Exchange Act. Uh, but at this moment, the data cannot be shared until the National Park Service is done with, with their work on that. Looks like we might have lost Pete completely. So. Yeah, but he's coming back. He's, I can see him working on, working on oh, trying to get his audio back. <laughs> but yeah, if any, if there's any more questions, please, please feel free to type them in and send them our way. Are you back? Can you, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, sorry about that. My Wi-Fi crashed. That was uh, bad timing. It's never fun when that happens. <laughs> But yeah, it looks like um, looks like we don't have any more questions. Anyone, Dan, Pete, do you have anything else you want to add? Just in case I got How cut much? off, and my my Wi-Fi crashed. I just thank you guys, both of you, everyone uh, at Regal, all the people who said 
green lighted you guys participating that speaks really well for the culture at regal and wow the technology just knocked me out it was great so pete before you before we we, get, we did have another question so and i think it's a good question for you to answer um, okay. um so juha asked how much did the project cost and i'll go ahead and let you answer that yeah that's actually something we didn't mention so no money changed hands during the entire project this was all volunteer all pro bono um which again speaks so highly to regal and all the other folks who participated because everybody showed up because it was important um and you know a unique opportunity my guess is if uh if i could anticipate a follow-up you know if the meter had been running this project would have cost, it, it would have been extraordinary in cost. Um, just from the hardware point of view, uh, the people's time, the expertise, um, it would have been, it would have been very expensive. So again, it just, it makes me that much more grateful that, you know, everybody, especially Regal leaned in and said, yep, we're in. Tell us where you need us. How can we help? And Pete, earlier, um, uh, I, I also mentioned to the audience that uh, there were also other sensors that were used too, and not just this Regal. Uh, yep. Maybe that's something you can share with the audience later on, or maybe do another power webinar of something different behind the scene of the Apatress. Oh, sure, sure. If uh, folks are interested in, you know, the the greater solution, and uh, I can I can make that available. It's uh, it was unique, absolutely yeah. unique. So we had, a, we had another question come from Ken Chase, who's asked, um, after putting everything together, did we have to redo any scans? Um, so Pan mm -hmm. and I have not have not gone back to Alcatraz, but but perhaps Pete, uh, you know, managing the entire project, well, maybe no. Um, is there? Well, let's be honest, there's always, you know, if you're a perfectionist like I am, there are always scans I'd like to do again or have another crack at or, um, but uh, those are mostly from, you know, a mobile scanner that we used. Um, uh, so short answer is no, I'm I'm actually really satisfied in terms of the coverage. Um, I, I am aware that there there was one space. I'm aware of one space that we could have got into that we didn't. Um, might I go back and get that? Oh yeah, because it feels like a gap. You know, nature abhors a vacuum. I want to I want to fill that hole. Uh, but no, I, I guess in general, has anything had to be redone? No, no. If anything. I'd like to go back and add. I agree with Pete. Um, when, when the first day when I was, we started on top of the roof, I wanted to get the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, I knew I knew uh, it was out the, I knew it was going to be out of my max range. Uh, but I, I think I could have gotten. I, the only reason why I didn't get anything is because of the weather condition. That's I think that's the only reason why. So. If I had another opportunity uh, uh, to 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 go back, that's what I would try to do. Yeah, especially with all the hoops that that Pete had to jump through in order to get this project off the ground, you know, you don't want to have to do it again or experience delays. It's, you know, it's hard enough to get started on it. So I completely agree. Um, so it looks like um, those are. Yep, we have the one hour answer. mark. Um, so I think we are we're done. Okay, well, thank you for for joining me on or joining us on the presentation, Pete. Thanks for taking the time, and thank you to all the attendees too who took the time to watch our presentation and learn with us. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks you too. Couldn't have done this without you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.